Hey everybody, it's Bust with Battles with Bust number 222. And today we're doing battle with Kane Vane. And so Kane, no E at the end, Vane with the E. Who came up with that? Who did it? What's your reasoning, Riot? Tell me, <laughs> tell me why you are the way that you are. But no, with this video, the, the thing I was I was curious about and thinking about uh, as I was wanting to, to put a video together for today was uh, what happened to Vane, right? Uh, during the, the Dark and Samba Dark and Saga Domination, uh, Seraphine was, of course, right at the top of the meta, all the various flavors of that deck, but uh, Vayne was hanging out right there in second. Uh, and so uh, was it a matter of uh, this is just the flavor of the week, right? Vayne is the new and shiny toy. She has that new car smell on her. Uh, is that the reason we're seeing so much Vayne? I mean, the deck was successful across all the different archetypes, so that doesn't seem to be you know, quite enough. And so if that wasn't it, is it a, ma a matter of Vayne is what was so good? Or was Vayne just the best thing that you could be doing in a Demacia Rally shell? And that last piece there, that could have some credence to it, but that doesn't really uh, answer how the Vayne decks play, right? The way that the Rally decks typically like to sequence is getting a fully wide board and taking advantage of a bunch of stat boosts, right? If you get to uh, play a four Demacia and attack twice, that's a, a just giant set of stats, right? You get 18 attack power twice. But these these Vayne decks just care about a single unit coming in. And so that was a space to where the rallies uh, weren't so big. They weren't so strong. Uh, if you were really just going to play the rally on one unit, you might be better served to play a Cataclysm, or you might be better served to play something like Single Combat or Concerted Strike. And so uh, I don't feel like that that really answered the question with the rallies. And so uh, if that wasn't it, then the Vayne decks must have just been good. And was the nerf to tumble enough to make Vayne uh, bad or enough to knock her out of the meta? And probably not. And so I, I think Vayne here is still quite strong. Uh, I think as Worlds comes up, you know, starting today, tune in if you have time. But uh, I think uh, as Vayne uh, will carry on heavily through Worlds, and she's going to have a lot of success there, I think that she's just kind of fallen out of favor because she caught a minor nerf and that new car smell has worn off a little bit. And so uh, there's basically two Vayne decks that are quite popular right now. There's Vayne Quinn. That's the PNZ version looking to use uh, quick attacks on the early challengers and then stacking that into uh, pretty safe attacks with the tumbles and cataclysms and the, and the dark and harpy. Uh, and then there's this Kane deck, which is the other currently popular one. And it is uh, very different uh, from the, the PNZ flavors of uh, vein, and that this is a full-on cane build around. This is a uh, really go tall deck, and it's really focused in on taking advantage of the cane synergies. And so, uh, vein with a V will be used a little bit in here, but uh, she's mainly here just as an efficient unit that generates a tumble. Uh, and this deck is a full-on cane build around. And so, uh, that's what you're going to be keeping in mind as you strategize against a lot of the other decks: is that uh, how do we protect our cane and then maximize him? And so. Uh, in terms of uh, getting the cane and drawing the cane, we have a lot of the cultist package in here. All of the cheap ones are in here, the Buru cultist, the Forsaken Bakai, and the Blooming cultist. That's our uh, kind of core ways uh, uh, to pick up cane into our hand. And then the rest of the deck is focused on either survivability or getting multi-attacks in. And so we have uh, the Reposts and the Unforgiven Cold to give cane a, a bit of protection inside of combat. And then we have the uh, the, the Cataclysms, the Vein Tumbles, the Furious Wielders, and the Concerted Strikes to get those strikes in with Kane. And so uh, that's the, the big thing I want to focus on. In every single one of these games, the, the, the basic play pattern is going to be don't die and then get Kane on board and do something with Kane, right? We're not some kind of aggro deck. I know we have a lot of cheap and efficient units in here. We have that elusive bro. We have the vein. That all sounds a lot like aggro stuff. We're not really an aggro deck. We'll take chip damage if it comes along. We are a full-on Kane build around. We're going to try to control the board with Kane, and then eventually just close out the game uh, with big Kane overwhelm attacks. And so uh, this is the deck. That's what we'll be doing battle with today. Let's head on in. That pay-to-win price has pretty much been paid in here. I, I think if I checked correctly, we've got uh, we've got everything accounted for. We'll see what happens. We'll see what turns up. See if the battles are good. Run into a day full of mini morphs. <laughs> we called it. We called our shot. Old Nora running around with the mini morphs and the vengeances. She can give us a bit of trouble. 
But here, we're going to be looking for those cheap plays to start with. We want our Buru Cultists, we want our Forsaken Bakais, we want our Blooming Cultists, and our Veins. Just things that we could put down on the early game. Help ensure that we don't die. Maybe get in a point of chip damage or two, but we're really just looking to use the Cultists as a means to draw Arcane. Yeah, it's tough for me but out here playing the Demacia decks, and I'm like, man, this would feel so good. This would feel so nice uh, if we could just get uh, <laughs> get a get a Petrocyte Broadwing on board, get a little bit of board control. You know, the 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 classic hits are what I'm looking for here. But, all right, we could have looked to trade uh, for the Elise here with the Momentous Choice. That doesn't feel super worthwhile. We can take a couple points of damage here against Nora and not really worry about it. She's not going to be hitting us with that aggro thunder. It's just uh, a little bit of chip damage here. You know, not enough to make me scared. So bring in Vayne. It, it, it is a bit unfortunate playing against Nora and like seeing this blooming cultist in our hand, unable to make the elusive block, but, you know, you know what the people say. It is what it is. Potentially get an equipped unit now, but... He's coming in with the heat. Interesting attack with the Elise. Why does he attack with Elise into Vayne? This deck usually, like, is it going to play a Black Spear? Like, I think I'm okay with that. I'm not, like, super invested in keeping this Vayne around. But I'm, I'm curious about the angle on this. This comes in with a Vengeance. Okay. Absolutely. What did we talk about in the in the deck phase, right? What is the thing that we are focused on and really want to be doing? Kane. That's with a K. And uh, seeing vengeances come down on our vein makes me feel like they just don't quite understand uh, the the intricacies of the format, or not the format, I should say, but the the matchup. But we might get some good hits in here. Disintegrate popping up. Eh, not the most exciting of spells when our units are so big, but we might get something going with it. What you got? Something big coming in. Quietus on the equipment. Vile Feast onto the Cultus. So do we really want to get any of this stuff down? I mean, I think it's probably reasonable to drop an equipment. It's not spectacular here, but it, it does give our combat cook the size it needs to kind of deal with and attack into this Elise. Again, I, I suspect he's probably just going to take this damage. It's not a, a really impressive attack, but getting in a little bit of chip damage isn't too upsetting. The next turn... We should be in the space to start drawing our cane. I'm curious if he like wants to open attack on us with the Nora, but the the, the blooming cultist will be our third, and getting that third uh, cultist on the board will let us uh, uh, draw cane. Equipped ally, strike the Nora. We didn't didn't have the chance to get the cultist down. That's okay. I could see an argument for not wanting to play the Furious Wielder as we uh, uh, as we're about to pick up the cane, but oh boy, sure, I think this is okay. And I mean that's his second vengeance this game as we're about to get our get our big boy on board. I have no real complaints about that. Uh, not the worst little target to be hitting with the with the the vile feast or whatever that thing is called. River Shaper into Nora. Nora flip. All right. I think he's out of portals at this point, though. He could potentially have a uh, could potentially have the like 
shuffle a portal in, draw a card kind of thing. But hopefully we can get this Nora off of the board before uh, before she pulls out expensive units. Right, we get the bonus attack for the Darken equipment. So hopefully a reasonable attack here. Oh shit, we should have hit with our Blooming Cultist as well. Oh my gosh, just have it all. Okay. Okay. That's the way today's gonna be, huh? Well, at least get the worst of it out of the way first, right? <laughs> and directly into another Nora. Now, we do have a, a blocker for this time, right? We have the Blooming Cultist on board. So we can deal with her, like, outside of combat. The question is gonna be, how much opportunity does he have to get units on the board? And... I mean, I don't, I guess, like, Eclectic Collection would be the big thing, but he's not going to be drawing cards right now. Oh, where's our, excuse me, the AGS he's already seen. Let's get Jeral on board so he can be kind of ready to block. And I don't think he's going to attack with Nora. I think he's going to do something else here. Uh, but this should give us at least a shot to... Stop his board and then Cataclysm after. Okay. Still got the Darkened Bow in here, right? Darkened Bow is Varus. Darkened Bow is Varus. We got the Darkened Scythe happening with these. All right, shouldn't be too much shenanigans. He waited until we got the Cataclysm off before doing anything, right? So when that unit's on board attacking, it's a little bit more uh, challenging to play your spells. But... All right, let's see what we can do. Put that draw two on top, right? We're either looking for Kane or looking for more cards. Whoa, bringing in Biggle Dust, huh? The F does that come from? <laughs> that was not on my radar for the day. All right. This is dark and power. And then just take three from the construct. I think that seems pretty reasonable to me. Come on, bud. Oh. Oh, man. It's cat time. Whew. He's heavy. Got him. Gonna say, what up, internet? He says, what up, friends? How you doing? <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for letting me be part of your day. All right, though. What are we gonna move on with now? Let's load up the Darkened Scythe onto this cultist. It's like we have a decent open attack right now, but... Uh, I, I think we sh I mean, should be sort of safe. Haunted Relic. Okay. They're not cards I was expecting to see. And man, we'd be so close to lethal if we had uh, if we had not messed up with... Uh, <laughs> and, and missed the attack with the Blooming Cultist. If he came in for five now and then six, we would have had the lethal if uh, we didn't miss that attack on the Kane turn. A little unfortunate. All right, an eclectic collection has popped off. All right, so won't be attacking onto this board. There's no real reason to kill the junk construct, no reason to kill these unleashed spirits. Uh, we can just hold off until a follow-up turn. Um, maybe we'll get a better a better combat here in the future. Well, maybe we get good combats now. You know, I'm certainly... Oh, we already got our main attack in, though. Okay, I was going to say... I, I was starting to think that the Blooming Cultists had Scout for some reason. That wouldn't be... That wouldn't be the worst ability in the world.
And I think we're still okay. So it's, it's a little scarier dropping the unending wave now that he's uh, nothing to fear. now that he's put a bunch of puff caps in our deck, but I don't think we really have a way around it. Anything good? Another cane to put on top. I. Right. The, the unforgiven cold. Should he decide to make an attack this turn? All seems pretty reasonable to me. Still, like, I, I think our victory is going to come from tumbling the blooming cultist. So we get to attack next turn and then crumble him in. Maybe... Maybe we should just tumble now. Have we... Have we... Like, there's no real reason to let him come in and draw an extra card, right? Yeah, we're gonna blow this up. Say, no friend. No life steals for you. Alright, elusive bro, get in there. Show him how to battle. Show him how it's done. Say a little, a little six-piece nugget right to the dome. All right, now Kane coming at us. I don't think we need to open attack here. Like anything that he has, that's going to be able to kill our blooming cultist, he can just do it in the middle of battle. All right, GG, GG. It feels good, right? If you're playing a deck that is a, a big and pure champion-centric build around and you get to fight through Double Vengeance Mini Morph and still win the game, that's pretty cool. That's, that's pretty A-OK -okay in my books, if you ask me. Oh, the one thing I did just realize there on that last turn, though, as we added that cane to the board, he would have taken the Darkened Scythe and moved it over to himself, and then that would have weakened our... Uh, it would have weakened our dude. Weakened our elusive unit. We may not have been able to lethal that turn after adding Kane. All right, Bakai number one. Do we want to just pick up another one? Like, we're up against the elusives deck, and we need to just kind of get on board fast. Maybe we got to pick the Blooming Cultist here. It's just like the, the downside with the Cultist is it's just it's so slow. Right, we can play it on turn three, but we won't have an equipped unit until like turn five. Should be my attack. I want to make my attack. But I mean, I guess with the attune, we could look to use the cultist to cataclysm this turn. A little bit of potential there. Just something, just anything to get these elusives off of the board. Did you hit Scout? No? <laughs> okay. This dumb deck out here trying to hit Scout. Alright, we might have the time to, to take down this Teemo, though. He's not the, the most important one in the world, but... I think, I mean, if opponent only hits us for like 4 damage this turn, it's not terrible. All right, let's see if he makes his, his little friend a 5-5. Five five. It would be pretty cool if he didn't. <laughs> that would be pretty cool. Ah, oh, fuck. Okay. GG. That is a fairly miserable matchup. I'll, I'll give that to you, elusives. All right, next battle, though. What is this? Ari Kennan with Freylord? Oh, I can already tell this is going to be awful. <laughs> I, can, I can already tell. 
trying to do stuff with Kane and dealing with recalls and dealing with frostbites. This is going to be bad. Well, this is this is the uh, uh, this this is actually the Spirits Unleashed elusive stack. I, I feel like this is probably going to be just as bad as the other elusive stack. Uh, you know, we're we're trying to play a very fair game here, and they're saying, "LOL, I'm not going to do that." But yeah, I'm pretty sure this is. I I saw. Uh, Monte Cristo was champion in this deck. Maybe it was him. All right. Well, no plays from opponent up to there. Sounds great. Let's get started with Vayne. Like, we could add the Blooming Cultist and then, uh, like, play the Combat Cook next turn so we're ready with an Elusive, but it seems a little unnecessary. So yeah, man, battle number 222. It reminds me, I, I, I love Mitch Hedberg's work. I'm sure you've heard of Mitch Hedberg if you travel across the Reddits and everybody likes to say, I, I used to do drugs. I still do, but I used to too. Very, very popular phrase amongst the Reddit crowd. And it, it, it sucks for me, man. Like, uh, it's, it's one of those few things as to where, like, boomer me is really upset with how, how the easy the kids have it these days. Because I, when I, when I heard of Mitch Hedberg, I was in, uh, I'd have been in like my early twenties, and this was like in, in the era before you were able to go to like YouTube and find anything, or, or um, go to Spotify and find any song or whatever. You had to like dig through the depths of the internet, through your kazaz and through your lime wires to try and find this shit, and uh, that that was how I eventually. Uh, came across finding Mitch was a, a guy at my local game store like found the CD and he, he told me what to Google search on the Kazaa to go and dig up the, the track for it. And it's, it's so brutal to have like, actually found it. And then him to be like so widespread now in a lot of his sayings uh, after his death is just quite, uh, I don't want to say it's unfortunate, you know, uh, I'm sure I'm glad that that people get to to experience Mitch uh, as opposed to not, but you know, it's one of those boomery things back in my day. One <laughs> back in my day when the when the the music wasn't freely had, the albums couldn't be found. We had to dig through a hot mess to find it. Uh, but uh, no, it's out there. It's good. My 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 favorite Mitch Hedberg one. Uh, it's so easy to say. I'll still, I'll still drop it on the wife on occasion whenever the appropriate time comes up. But he, ha he has. Um, let's get this cultist in here. He says you should never have a uh, an out of order sign for an escalator. The sign should sim simply say escalator temporarily stairs. Uh, I love it. It's one of my favorites. Escalator temporarily stairs. But. Kids these days, man, they don't know how good they got it. Here's how good this guy's about to get this, just randing him into fish fight. That feels pretty good. I'm on board with that happening. Now it's like, is it ever worth dropping in Pot of Pains? Two, four, six, we'll have seven mana next turn. We can still play Kane. We can tumble or something. Okay. Maybe we don't need to, but... If we can force our opponent to spend their mana on a like another homecoming or a concussive palm or something, I think it gets us in a reasonable space. The child is gone. The so we've got the cane. He's ready to attack. We have the tumble. We have the second vein for the condemn. Like lots of good stuff we can do this turn. We can really pop off. Like this is the kind of space to where, uh, assuming he doesn't have like a concussive palm or something, we can attack with cane. Get the hook. We can tumble, that's going to be his second attack, he'll flip, come back to hand, we can replay. Then we can Cataclysm on the Overwhelm side uh, and punch in some extra damage. So, lots of cool stuff we have potential for here. Tell opponent does Ionian things. <laughs> you know opponent's going to do Ionian things. Get him for six. Interesting. He sent back the combat cook instead of Kane. I wonder if he picked the wrong one. 
do not want pot of pain. Happy enough with my darkened equipment. Alright, give me some of them free tumbles while we're at it. That sounds pretty cool. Pretty cool. Less cool, but we can still potentially pull this one off. I think we've got the game here. So let's condemn. We'll get a strike with Kane onto a dum dum. That's going to give him a flip. Going to come back to hand. We could pull this off even if he was still stunned, right? Because you can cataclysm a stunned unit. That was not. A, did not get a second strike. Ah, this game's dumb. All right. Well, let's kill all this stuff. <laughs> I guess. I guess, I guess we can try this again next turn. We'll have a tumble, we'll have a shadow step. Maybe we can pull this off then. But I, I can assure you opponent is regretting uh, letting us keep the cane instead of... Um, instead of the combat cook. Now, interesting space. This is one of these spots to where I could actually see an argument for picking the elusive copy. You almost never take the elusive copy, but uh, as we are, you know, coming in here with the tumbles, if this wasn't an elusive's deck, it would make a lot more sense. You know, if we were playing against scouts or something, maybe you'd want to put uh, put put him onto the. Uh, Uh, elusive track, but here does, doesn't make as much sense. Alright, well I'm going to add the cultist first, just to get us that, that, that first taste of battle here. And then we can follow up with Kane. Opponent just tapped out for this Ari. I think we should be okay at this point, but uh, we can still play Kane and drop a momentous choice if we need to. Thought we were going to be able to get Kane in there as well. A little, little bit of whoopsies, but this is still okay. I mean, do we just take it? Probably just take it, right? He's so close to dead. I don't do meditation. All right. Battle time. Escalator temporarily stares, my dude. <laughs> Everyone really does look better in red. I can't I can't remember if the if the, the statement I heard was truth, but uh there, there's also a Mitch Hedberg skit where he talks about Smacky the Frog, the uh the UK equivalent of uh of Smokey the Bear. And apparently, Sm Smacky the Frog never existed. I, I never, I never did uh, did did my research. I didn't pull up the Facebook and do my research on that one. But I, I think I remember seeing a comment somewhere that people in the UK are well unaware of what uh, what Smacky the Frog is. I think Smokey the Bear got retired out of America as well. I don't think uh, I don't think he's the the children's forest fire prevention mascot anymore. Might be wrong on that one as well. Wouldn't be the first time I was wrong, but. I think that might be a thing. So here, let's put this cultist on top. Just get us a, a, a fearsome blocker down. We had all those other cards as it was. All right, Blooming Cultist. You'll be ready next turn. We can drop the Cultist. We can drop the Aegeus. Uh, we'll have the equipped unit for the Ambitious Cultist at that point. Get the free spell in our hand. You know, get things rolling a little bit.
Got bro, got my elusive. Oh, it's on the equipment. Okay, that's fine. I thought, I thought we were losing our dude, and I was like, oh no, that was a that was a lot. That was too much. So we've equipped an ally. That's all the ambitious cultist cares about. He doesn't need to see an ally. It doesn't have to be right now. He just needs to have seen it at some point in the game. Or had it happen at some point in the game. A single empire ruled by the true king. Interesting. Sure. So he'll have a good midnight raid this turn. Well, I assume he's going to midnight raid the Ruined Reckoner, give it the Hallowed, and then try and trade with the Cultist. Ooh, he's going to give us free blocks next turn? Hi, I'm on board. Interesting. Now we can we can get on the cane train. It's just like, uh, we have our throwaway unit for the giant Hallowed guy, right? It's the Ambitious Cultist. It's so weird he didn't send in the Ruined Reckoner. He's, he's aware of these other canes, right? This is the... I think this is the cane that he would have seen us pick up. Okay. So weird. Are we are we about to face down a, um, a another ravenous flock? Is that is that why things are going the way they're going? Apparently not. All right. Take those can't block shenanigans off our unit, please. All right. She's out of the way. Kane's going to come back. You know what we're going to do? We're going to play Kane, and then we're going to kill his unit. Now, the I guess the, the question with this Kane is... Do we want to actually do it this turn? Because, I mean, we have we have the gifts from beyond in hand, right? We can generate a, uh, a a moon weapon and then use it multiple times over the course of the next turn, right? So say we put uh, the, the plus one and lifesteal thing onto Kane and then get multiple attacks in with him. Like, there, there could potentially be something there. We don't quite have the time now that he's played Hallowed Dancers, but I think it was definitely worth a uh, worth a consideration. Has he got a vengeance? He can't have vengeance. He's got three mana. You want to stun this. You want the combat to happen. So you let the uh, the the cane get into combat with the eternal dancers, and then you stun it out of the out of the cataclysm. This is fine. That was fine. I tell you. Oh man, we're out of we're out of free combat cards. <laughs> what a bummer. Alright, I think we're okay though. Things are looking decent. I could see an argument for doing a draw two here. I was I think I had in my head that I just wanted gifts from beyond overwhelm onto Jeral and then see how close that gets us. Are we better off just killing this thing? I guess we could stun it. Stun's a little bit safer than uh, damage. This thing can block, right? When I'm summoned, Grant can't block. Okay. Alright, well, looks like the good times are over. In terms of casting all these sweet spells. 
but we should still be in a pretty safe spot. I, I feel pretty safe against this deck when we have the Unforgiving Cold. The 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 big card to worry about here would be a Harrowing, right? If he gets to play the Harrowing, bring back the Eternal Dancers, bring back the um, Ruined Reckoner. I don't think he'd be able to pull off the full combo on us, but uh, you, you can definitely cause some problems. There it is. All right, looks like our squad can't block. Sad day for you. Got the Midnight Raid in hand. So who do we need to kill here? It's like I don't want him getting the Eternal Dancers into combat. I think that's the first one. And then we can deal with the next biggest ones from there. He might be able to still just lethal us, but... Uh, we'll see. And the... The, the next problem is this, like, first combat gets to happen. We can't do the Unforgiving Cold and the Blooming Cultus without letting him get a, a free attack in. He, can, he did not he did not think through how he was doing that, though. I don't think it's going to matter, but that was definitely a, a slop fest from opponent. What's his Hallowed at? Sixth. Yeah, we can't win this. That's frustrating. I don't know. I don't know if we could have won that a turn earlier or not, but that's rough. All right. Next battle, though. It's like a, we we had some of the we had so many of those those attacks. Like, I'm just curious if there wasn't a spot if we shouldn't have like held up a little bit more, because is like he wasn't present, presenting scary boards. The the thing that's like rough with those is we have like cataclysm and the quick attack thing. Uh, you can't use those in the middle of combat, and so we need to be able to strike down his his big hallowed unit. And you don't know what the big hallowed unit is going to be until the the combat starts. And so the only way to deal with that's the is the Furious Wielder or our one copy of Concerted Strike, and it's just not, not enough there. I, I feel like a, someone more uh, more skilled with the deck would have probably easily taken that game down. That felt like a game that we should have just outright won. Uh, but, but we didn't. Let's go ahead and drop this in. We're not going to be spending this mana anytime soon. Let's get some of the, uh, the advantages. I want some advantages, Doc Uta. I'm gonna take him. Get you, Buru Cultist. Being all statty and everything. <laughs> Feels good, doesn't it, my dude? Let's keep it up. I mean, if he follows up with another unit and then wants to trade, like, a sharp sight into our Blooming Cultist, I, I think I'm okay with it. I'm Same deal here. If he wants to play the sharp sight and trade it into our one drop, that's completely fine. It still shrinks up his uh, his broad wing for the future turns. Fighting food and cooking evil. Fight and food and cook and evil. There you go, dude. I wonder... Well, that's very strange. Why is he... Is he just preventing the damage? Like, why is he not using it to take down the cultist to turn from now? Weird. Weird, I tell you. So we can't do too much in the face of Sivir right now, right? We have all these uh, kind of interactive cards, but they don't play fantastically into her. I think that's okay. Like, I'm not really amped about this spot in terms of, like, reposting into Sivir in the middle of combat. It's too easy for them to have a concerted strike or something when they have all this mana. This is fine. He has a second Cataclysm. That'll be kind of meh. 
But in terms of this one, I think it's okay. Uh, you gotta be kidding me. All right, I guess you just have it sometimes. Guess you just have it. Where does this guy come from? He's just physically playing Voidling and Sivir Kaisa. Oh, he's playing Kaisa, not Action. I guess that makes more sense. <laughs> I was like, the fuck are you doing with that thing? This is brutal. Wow. I mean, what, <laughs> what, what more can you say? What more can you say? All right. I'll go ahead and mark that one a loss and move forward. I don't know. the The thing that I was thinking that that we might have been doing incorrectly there was we we could have gotten Geral down like the the Darken equipment as the challenger and then put Quick Attack on him. But we, we still fall to that same spot to where we just die to a, a Cataclysm. There's there's no way we're beating three Cataclysms there, though. It's not that like Cataclysm is some kind of big and massively overpowered card or something. It's just the, the terms of uh, we're playing a four drop and trading with this three. We're trading a five drop and trading with this three. We're playing another four drop and trading with this three. And so we're in for uh, 12 mana to his nine. And he's just like takes all the tempo and sucks all the life out of the game. It's not that... Uh, you know, the, the Cataclysm Quick Attacker is too much, it's just that too much in that spot. I don't know, maybe we should have gone for the Repost. <laughs> it's just, I, I guarantee you, if we'd gone for the Repost, he would have just had a, uh, he would have had a, uh, a concerted strike. That's just the way that game was going. All right, well, let's get his dumb units off the board and <laughs> move on to the next one. All right, everybody trading one drops. Are we are we done with this this idea this theme? I'm not sure why he'd hold on to inventive chemist unless he was going to add a um, roiling sands to the board next turn. Right, Vein, get in here and do your thing. I'm fine to trade Vein in some kind of combat here, right? If he has a, a shaped stone and wants to trade his shaped stone and rock hopper for Vein, giving us a crumble in the process, or giving us a tumble in the process, I think that's okay. I'm not super worried about that. Kind of same deal coming into next turn. If he's going to drop a, uh, what do you call it? Deal two damage to a unit, whatever that thing is. Like, I'm not I'm not worried about that either. But we'll take the quick attack equipment. That's the the safe one here. Curious, he's, he's there's drop the bomb. Not surprised. It feels like he's messed up his his landmarks in the sense. Well, these aren't units that you really want to be copying with Talia, anyways. But it seems like he's approached that oddly. But he's down to two cards in hand. Feels pretty good from our side of the board. See if we want to add Kane this turn or save him up for next turn, but he's gonna he's gonna be making some magic happen ASAP. So like, I I don't think this deck usually plays quicksand anymore. Now that they've come in and started adding things like drop the bomb, I just don't think they have that capability in their in their hands anymore. I mean, he may, I guess, but it doesn't doesn't strike me as what we're about to run into, right? If we're gonna repost Kane and Tatalia and he has a quicksand, we just lose the game. But I think they they most commonly play zero copies and sometimes play one. But I don't think we're going to tumble this turn, so let's add a cultist. 
Then we'll do this reposted Talia. Just gonna get us, isn't he? He's gonna be like, "Hello, well, I play." <laughs> Bust is talking about quicksand. He's saying I don't have it, and then he's gonna have it. Okay. I'm still gonna try and take down the Talia. If it's the same deal as the as the previous one, where he has another drop the bomb. I'm, I'm okay with that. Talia is his only real unit that matters here. Hourglass is fine. We can still deal with this Talia on the board. I think we have enough health to where we don't die to the Absolver. And we can... Oh. Well, there's that. So she represents 12 damage right now. I think we're okay. We need to do something with Kane, though. Or he's, he's just going to die in combat, right? Or are we just dead? Can do the, add a cultist and then just play another cane next turn. Maybe that's the angle. Uh, this is <laughs> this is this is just gonna be a uh, this is gonna be an absolver. We'll at least play around the shaped stone, but oh, he didn't have it. <laughs> the, the way the, the the way the games have gone today, I just assumed it was a, a guarantee. All right, the shepherd's authority is a little small. I thought we might have been able to uh... maybe. Maybe we needed that one extra mana here. I didn't I didn't sit around and do the mathematics on on how this was actually looking. You are the tool. I am the weapon. Mized into feeble mind. It would be a lot better this turn if we had six mana instead of five, right? If we wanted to both tumble and cataclysm. But we, we like we have to get Talia off of the board. Right? So if we're gonna get Talia off of the board, we need to cataclysm with the combat cook and then take a standard uh, attack with Kane. Right? So if we're doing all of that Well, The, the new thing I'm thinking of is just overriding the Darken equipment with the, the fix-em-up. So Kane gets to make a quick attack challenge and not die, and then still be a blocker next turn. That's what I'm thinking, I tell you. Doesn't get quick attack. It's like I, I, it's like, where's this quick attack? I want you to have that naturally. Why don't you have it? It took me a while to figure out. Hmm. Okay. These games have been brutal. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't think the the ancient hourglass was going to be that much, but apparently just wrong. Is he open? You gotta be open in here, right? Oh, no, I guess I guess you don't have to just open if you're gonna draw Ziggs. Uh, okay. Let's 
So, are we better off dropping the cultist and picking a random spell and then being able to draw two? It's like, do we have to draw a furious? Well, we have five good draws in here, right? Between the furious wielder and... Um, between the furious wielder and the, the unforgiving cult. So I'm going to drop the Blooming Cultist just to pick up that mana. He doesn't take the hook. That's sloppy. He hit a wielder. Are we still dead? Ah, it's so brutal if that's, <laughs> if that's what we have to be dealing with. Yeah, we're taking, taking the Rock Hopper damage and the, the Short Fuse. Uh, so brutal. If we picked up the other spell, we could have gotten out of that one. Just... Uh, when games come together like that, it's tough. It's like you have, you have the the easy way out. Just fucking take it. Just put a hook onto put a, put a, a zigs hook onto the one health unit, or just don't use your cards. Don't use your cards. <sighs> All right. Anywho, one more. We got the time for one more. That'll get us up to the up to the hour mark here. Let's see how we go. So man, as this one comes in, oh, this is this will be a thirty minute one here. <laughs> <laughs> I did want to to drop a, my my hot take on the old Twitter, and I think it's it's sad, man. As um, you know, as I I personally reflect on it, just for like from the perspective of being an employee, uh, to to have your your job just kind of like swept out from under you, that that's that seems like it's pretty unfortunate to me, in the sense that like I like my job, I'm not doing a, a job search. I'm happy with how things are going. Um, I would prefer to have this job and not just have some, you know, some nutter come in and, and you know, swipe the rug out from underneath me. And so, like, just in that sense, I, I think it sucks. Like, the, the general sentiment that you see from, like, the 15-year-olds the that run around on Reddit are that, you know, everybody that works there is going to be fine, right? You're some kind of software engineer because you work at Twitter. You know, you, you can just write up the resume and send it over to... Microsoft and they'll be like, oh man, you worked at Twitter. We would love to have you on the team. But that's like not entirely how it works, right? You know, if you enjoy your job, you don't want to go somewhere else. There's only a handful of companies that work on the like massive, 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 massive problems that you get at Twitter. Uh, and, you know, that's just for the software engineering folks. That doesn't like equate to all of like the, the salespeople and the analysts and the people that answer the phones and the assistants and the accountants and all that like you're not going to be like oh cool i'm an accountant at twitter and uh you know daddy elon has gone bonkers maybe maybe the this other company will hire me right that's not, that's just not the way the world goes and so it's unfortunate in all those people as well but like even beyond all of that i, I think it's kind of easy to forget about the 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 grand sense that, that twitter provides for a lot of people in the sense that if I want to go and read some factual news, I want to see what, you know, the, the take is on a uh, strong American publication. I can't go and read the New York Times, right? They don't have a, uh, a free version. You have to, to, to pay for it. And then uh, I think the, the, the UK paper, whichever one's the real one, I'll, I'll call the UK paper end up being like whatever the fucking tabloid one is. But I'm pretty sure it's uh, is it, it's not the register. It's, I don't know, it's something. But they've, they've gone to a pay model. Uh, it's like all of them are just switching. And, um, you know, if you're wanting to get some kind of like factual news and you're not in like America or somewhere with like a really strong uh, internet presence, you can't get it. Or if you're in a country to where... Um, uh, maybe uh, the, the, the news is controlled by the government or, you know, it's just like the, the ability for the information to get out there from something like Twitter is very strong and big. And uh, to have that taken away would be unfortunate for a, a large portion of the population. And so I'm honestly surprised it's still up and running today in the sense that uh, be, being someone that works in the software industry, and you know how fickle things can be and how it can go in terms of uh, if people aren't there to just babysit stuff a lot of times it just breaks and uh, i think you know it's probably pretty lucky <laughs> that a day later uh, the 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 system is still up and running 
but it's it, it just like feels like a real net negative, especially given the, a lot of the work that the Twitter did in terms of making sure that your your news and was factual and your posts were factual. And when the president of the United States comes out and says a bunch of stupid shit about COVID not being real, then there were the people there to say that hey, this is uh, we we've had the fact checkers on this and this was you know inaccurate. It's just you know such a useful tool for the planet and to to have it. You know, I, I, I'm not like a, an Elon Musk fanboy by any means. I, I I think he is tanking for a reason or doing whatever he's doing for a reason. He might be doing what it takes to make Twitter be a profitable company. I don't know. But uh, I, I think as it stands, it's a it's a net loss for, for pretty much everyone involved, uh, the, the way that it's going. So we'll see. It's a real bummer out there. If you're in an earthquake, where do you go? Twitter. There's a, a, a emergency in your area with like a, a flood or a wildfire, or snowstorm, whatever. Where can you go and check on up the up to the minute stuff? Twitter. It's just to, to have that taken away is just a, just a huge downfall. So. Where do you get your best memes? <laughs> That's a step too far, Bust. I get my good memes from Reddit. And it, is, it sounds like that, like the, what, what I kind of take it as at the moment is the, the people that are still stuck working there are the ones that uh, came to America on a visa. You know, if you're from a foreign country and you didn't have the citizenship, I don't know how that, that stuff all works out, but it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a real shitty situation to uh, uproot your life to come here for a job and then you work here for six months and somebody goes, LOL, I bought the company as a fucking meme. Uh, and now you either have to go back home uh, or you have to stick it out for what is supposed to be ridiculous work hours. I uh, just, I, I feel for all of those people. All right, though. Well, that last game wasn't much of a game anyways. And so at least I got my, my Twitter rant in right before the end. <laughs> and we can move on. So that's going to do it with our run. It wasn't the most successful of runs, but granted, I'm not a, a humongous Kane Vane player. And I feel like a couple of those games, most certainly, uh, if they'd been in the hands of a, a more experienced Kane Vane player, uh, they probably would have gone our way, uh, especially uh, uh, the two previous ones, the, the harrowing game, and there was another one in here. And so uh, you know, if you get to if you get to flip two of those games uh, and switch us to being uh, four and three instead of two and five, then it, then it looks to be much much better. But uh, you know, it's, it's different play patterns, it's different ways of going about things. Uh, it should still be a you know reasonably strong deck in the meta. Uh, it just takes a, a bit of getting used to. As I'm a a player that's usually more in that uh, Legion rearguard Demacia board control type area, it's always awkward for me switching over to these decks like a pantheon deck that's going tall with one unit or switching over to Kane here and then just kind of having that feeling of you know when it's safe to play cards when it's safe to go for things when to go forward when to go back how close you are to actually dying uh th those are the things as to where if you're playing that go tall unit kind of thing they come to you a little bit more naturally and here i feel like uh, we we definitely uh jabbed when we should have dashed or we strafed when we should have jumped or or whatever your uh your your metaphor is and didn't play those perfectly but you know i, I think it's still a pretty good deck I, I think the other thing to really consider with kane uh as we come into the next darken set we should have another cultist champion and more cultist cards and more darken equipments to run around with and so uh he he should be getting more tools in the next set as well and so again uh, as you're, you know, kind of keeping things in mind for the, the next cards. I think the new set comes out the first week of December. And so it's uh, maybe two, three weeks away. Uh, and so having these kind of thoughts and idea uh, fresh in your head shouldn't be that bad. But, you know, hopefully this was useful to you. If you like this idea of a deck, run with it. If you're uh, watching Worlds this weekend, uh, maybe this will give you a bit of a primer into a deck you might be seeing. Uh, and get you ready for that. And I guess the last thing I'll say before we go is talking about worlds. You, you got to go and watch it. You don't have to watch it. Just at least turn it on, right? <laughs> the the uh, if if you want to have nice things, you have to go and and interact with this stuff. And so if you want 
competitive play to be big, you have to go and turn on the stream. If you want to have Twitch streams of high-level Runeterra events, you have to go and turn on the stream. You have to uh, at least do some kind of meaningful interaction with the thing. Uh, if you have the chance to watch it, great. If you have the chance to meaningfully interact with the Twitch chat, awesome. Uh, but, uh, you know, at a bare minimum, at least, you know, turn it on in the background and mute it or something. At least get that view count lifted up. Let Riot know that uh, people do care about the competitive scene. They do care about uh, casts. They do care about this stuff being out there on Twitch. Because uh, for the most part, that's all gone now. And so if people don't support it, they're going to ask the question, why do we why do we try, right? You know, if it's not a deal of, uh, I didn't want you to buy me flowers. I wanted you to ask me if I wanted them. Like, it, it's just straight up. If nobody in interacts or deals with it, they're just not going to do it anymore. And so uh, if you want those kind of... Uh, uh, high profile events and, and competitive play and competitive scenes and all that, you at least got to do the bare minimum of uh, turning on the stream and muting it. So there you have it. That's the end. That's all I got. That's going to do it for us today. And so I hope everyone enjoyed the video. Hope you maybe learned a thing or two along the way and you had a good time watching. Uh, this is Bust and we thank you for being here.